I want to welcome uh, our participants to uh, this afternoon's debate. Um, I'm very, very happy that so many of you uh, are joining. At the moment, there are 160 people watching us. Um, I'm very happy about that and glad. Um, my name is Anna Schwarz. I'm heading the Global Transformation Program of the Heinrich Böll Foundation's office in Brussels. Um, the Heinrich Böll Foundation is a political foundation which is affiliated to the German Green Party. Um, our main tenants are uh, ecology, sustainability, democracy, and human rights. Um, and uh, here in Brussels, uh, in our office in Brussels, we are uh, representing the foundation vis-a-vis -vis the European institutions, but also international institutions and international NGOs. <coughs> civil society associations and also media based in Brussels. Um, one of the policy fields we um, follow very, very closely here in Brussels is the European migration and asylum policy. And uh, we have a focus on a focus on return policies, search and rescue in the Mediterranean and also the reception of refugees and migrants. Um, yeah. There are still participants uh, joining, which is really great. It shows that this debate that we're having today um, on Frontex and human rights at the EU border is very timely. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen you can click on it and then you can raise your questions and we're gonna collect them and um hopefully answer as many as possible in the end um in the last 40 to 30 minutes um, of this event um now it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator um neda nuraya kia who is uh, my colleague in the Heinrich Böll Foundation, Neda, is the head um, of Migration Policy Europe in the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, um, and she is based in our office in Greece. Um, before joining the Heinrich Böll Foundation, she uh, uh, she joined the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, last December, so quite recently. And um, before joining the Heinrich Böll Foundation, she was the head of office of Luisa Amtsberg a um, member of the German Bundestag and spokesperson, and she's, Luisa is also the spokesperson of the Green Group for Refugee Policies. Uh, and previously, uh, Neda also worked on uh, good governance and peace and conflict um, questions in the Middle East. And with that being said, I hand over to you, Neda. Thank you very much, Anna, and a warm welcome, everyone, from my side as well. Um, Anna, thank you also for organizing today's event, which um, indeed is very timely. I think the number of participants show it. Um, before introducing our panelists, allow me to give you a very brief update on where we are today with regard to human rights and Frontex at our EU external borders. Um, for the past month, we've seen a growing number of reported serious human rights violations in the Aegean and in the Western Balkans. Civil so society organizations, as well as journalists, reported on numerous cases of so-called pushbacks, illegal state measures by which refugees and migrants were forced back over a border without any possibility to apply for asylum at the EU external borders. The human rights organization Mare Liberum, who is monitoring and documenting the situation on the island of Lesbos and beyond, counted more than 300 incidents at the Greek sea border in 2020 alone, with some 9,800 people being pushed back. Also for 2020, the Danish Refugee Council recorded about 15,700 pushbacks from Croatia to Bosnia-Herzegovina, with more than 60% of these being um, violent. In October last year, several media outlets, including Germany's Der Spiegel, published reports alleging Frontex, the EU Border and Coast Guards Agency, um, involvement in pushback operations at the Greek-Turkish maritime border, claiming that refugees and migrants were being forced out of EU waters. 
the allegations led Home Affairs Commissioner Ilva Johansson to call for an urgent, extraordinary Frontex Management Board meeting and the EU Ombudswoman to open an inquiry. The allegations... <clears throat> Um, early December, Executive Director Fabrice uh, Legerie denied his agency was involved in pushbacks, saying, um, we have not found evidence of Frontex staff taking part in illegal activities. However, he did not manage to convince all MEPs and the Greens success successfully asked the Parliament to launch an inquiry. And we have Tineke Strick with us today. Um, who is this inquiry's rapporteur, and we will talk about it in, um, in a bit. Um, besides these accusations, Frontex is also being accused of having met with a number of unregistered lobbyists, and the EU's anti-fraud agency, Olaf, has opened an investigation into Frontex over serious allegations of harassment, misconduct, and migrant pushbacks as well. One has to keep in mind that, in theory, there are attempts to ensure the agency's compliance and respect for fundamental and EU rights. For instance, for instance all personnel is obliged to file a so-called serious incident re report when witnessing any legal violation, which then should lead to an investigation. However, Frontex does not have the power to conduct investigations um, in the member states. Also, there is a regulation that says the agency should recruit at least 40 fundamental rights uh, monitors to oversee the agency's compliance with the, uh, human and EU rights. And this process should have been completed by December last year. Um, but in fact, none of them was recruited by now and the agency explained to have faced difficulties in doing so. Overall, Frontex lately get, uh, did go through a phase of dramatic expansion regarding the scope of its mended budget from 6 million euros in 2005 to 460 million euros last year and personnel with a plan to build a 10,000 strong standing corps of border guards. And uh, in fact, it might seem as if strengthening the EU border and coast guard agency is one of the few if not uh, the only uh, step upon which EU leaders have been able to agree within the otherwise rather disputed field of migration and asylum. So these developments surely create a lot of room for discussion and I'm thankful for today's excellent panel helping us shedding um, light on these questions, beginning with Professor Nora Markert. She is Professor of International Public Law and International Human Rights at the University of Münster. She's a co-founder of the Humboldt Law Clinic Human and Fundamental Rights and of the Refugee Law Clinic Hamburg. She is Vice President of the Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte e.V., a strategic litigation NGO, and advises the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights on its migration and gender litigation. Very welcome. We also have Matthias Oehl with us, who is the Director for Border Interoperability operability and innovation in DG migration and home affairs of the European Commission. Before assuming this position in May 2017, he was director for migration and security funds in the same DG from January 2016. Head of unit for asylum as of April 2012 and special advisor on, in the cabinet of the president of the European Council as of January 2010. Very welcome to you as well, Mr. Oehl. We also welcome um, Andreas Potakis, who is the Greek Ombudsman. He was elected by Parliament to the position of Greek Ombudsman in 2016 for a term for six, of six years. He also is a professor at the European Law and Governance School and the alternate director of the Academy of European Public Law. Prior to his current position, Mr. Potakis served as legal advisor to the Hellenic government, also at head of as head of the legal office. He has published extensively on a wide range of areas, including inter alia European public law and the legal protection of human rights. And last not least, we have with us today Tineke Strick, uh, who is a member of the European Parliament for the Dutch Green Party Grön Links. She's the rapporteur for the inquiry report of the Frontex Scrutiny Group of the European Parliament's investigation. Um, on the internal management and fundamental rights compliance of Frontex. Before, she was an associate professor for migration law at the University of Nijmegen and member of the Dutch Senate. So, Inika Strick, I would like to 
open the floor for you. And of course, we are all curious to hear everything about this, um, this the work of this Frontex scrutiny group. Um, what are you focusing on? When can we expect first results? And um, what do you expect um, the report to to um, to reach, sort of? So, um, please. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for organizing this and for inviting me. I understand I only have five minutes, so uh, I will make a few introductory remarks before I go into uh, information on the inquiry. Um, I think uh, what is now at stake, it's very important to the EU. Uh, I think it's important that we can show and guarantee that fundamental rights go hand in hand with guarding our borders. I think if we do not manage to uh, ensure compliance with fundamental rights by guarding our borders that we uh, lose our credibility. And what you see, of course, uh, the last years, we saw a lot of reports about pushback allegations from different border uh, countries of the EU. Um, and uh, not only from, uh, um, well, from diverse sources, actually not only from investigative journalists, but also from NGOs and also from uh, national ombudsmen. And um, uh, last year, we requested also the Fundamental Rights Agency to map uh, those uh, uh, incidents, uh, allegations, and they actually uh, confirmed the systematic character of these pushbacks taking place. Now, uh, for us, it's a big concern that this seems to happen in an atmosphere of impunity. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, follow-up or, or responses to, uh, to those allegations. Uh, if they are, it's, they are all declared inadmissible and the European Commission seems to be very hesitant to go into it uh, as guardian of the treaty. So really looking, investigating those allegations and uh, start to enforce compliance. Uh, this is of course very serious and therefore it's so important and it was so disappointing to get information about uh, uh, from the investigative journalists on the complicity of Frontex in those uh, cases. Uh, what we see during the last years is that um, while Frontex, as you already explained, has grown into its mandate, it has got a stronger mandate, uh, it has got more tasks and it got a lot more uh, staff, that it becomes more and more important, of course, that its structures and its culture, if it comes to fundamental rights, is also in place. Um, we saw during with each legislation, the emphasis on human rights became stronger, you know, with its obligations for a fundamental rights strategy, with the establishment of the fundamental rights officer, with the complaint mechanism. But it, every time it was a sort of a struggle to make sure that there's an, a, a proactive attitude of Frontex and, and taking responsibility for what is happening. I think that there's a big awareness among different actors that there needs to be accountability. Uh, and that also requires transparency and um, awareness among all, on all different levels of Frontex on how important it is uh, that we need to be aware of uh, violations that they can take place and what the role of Frontex should be in that uh, situation. Um, we see in, in, indeed in the Benecat report, um, there is the reporting about, well, that, that Frontex uh, observed pushbacks taking place, that they sometimes even uh, um, participated in it in, in that sense that they intercepted first, uh, followed by a pushback by the Greek authorities. And also that uh, it was not, there was not an effective and adequate follow-up in the sense of not uh, informing sometimes even the head office or uh, 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 not uh, um, uh, even discouraging some national uh, uh, border guards who were participating in joint operations from uh, uh, filing a, a serious incidents uh, uh, report. Um, uh, we heard the executive director say, yeah, on, on one incident, we asked the Greek uh, uh, government, but the Greek government denied, and then there's nothing more we can do. Uh, I really think that this deserves a thorough uh, uh, inquiry on uh, what actually happened, you know, to, to really look at all those different allegations, what was the case, and also to see what should Frontex have done 
uh, if those uh, uh, situations have occurred. Uh, because I think it's very important that we, we have different provisions in our regulation that they are interpreted in, um, in good faith, so to say, and, and that we have a common interpretation of those uh, provisions. If you look, for instance, in Article 46 of the regulation, which makes clear that uh, 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 Frontex is not allowed to participate in operations in a member state which violates the human rights, then you already know that um, Frontex needs to take a proactive stance, need to, with every signal, uh, take that seriously and look into what is actually going on and can we still continue uh, cooperating with these authorities. Um, uh, from, from what we saw from the Bellicat report, we don't get this, this sense of urgency and, and, and active uh, uh, inquiries from the side of Frontex, but of course we need to die, dig, dig into that as well. But also if you look at other countries, we really have reasons to um, but to have doubts or, or concerns if this is really applied in the right way. If you look on Hungary, for instance, uh, ever since 2016, we know about the violations of fundamental rights by the Hungarian government, by uh, pushbacks, uh, uh, the transit zones, which are not uh, in compliance with human rights, um, and, and the erecting fences and not giving a proper access to an asylum procedure. Even though the fundamental rights officer advised already a few years ago to withdraw from Hungary, it only happened last month after a subsequent judgment of the Court of Justice. And this is really raising questions as to how does this, uh, how does this mechanism work? The serious incidents report, how serious are the uh, advices of the fundamental rights officer taken? Uh, what about complaint mechanisms? Is this effective uh, or not? Um, we also have, you know, if you also if you look at the Croatian situation, for instance, uh, we asked in the Libe committee uh, several times about what does Frontex know about these allegations of uh, pushbacks at the, at the uh, Croatian land border? And then Frontex says, yeah, we are not there at the, the territory. That's true. They're not there on the, on the land border, but they are su giving support from the air. Uh, and then if they say, yeah, we didn't hear about any uh, uh, signals or allegations, then they implicitly legitimate what's going on at the land border if they don't know. And it also raises questions then if there are such serious allegations also coming from the Croatian ombudsman, then what did Frontex do in order to investigate about uh, uh, what was exactly going on? Because even if you give support from the air, it's still a, a, a way of uh, supporting and participating in uh, uh, border control activities. So I, I think uh, now we have this Greek situation with this serious uh, and very concrete mapping of what has going on. We have a lot of other examples which really raise uh, serious concerns. And uh, indeed, I'm, I'm, I, we have a ongoing investigations. Uh, we have an internal working group of the management board. I think Matthias O will, will say something about that. We have the EU Ombudsman uh, doing an investigation on the complaint mechanism. We have the OLAF investigations. Uh, and I think it's very uh, important that also the European Parliament, uh, where Frontex uh, is accountable to, um, does a kind of mapping of uh, all the allegations that are uh, ongoing. And this is what we will try to do. So we will certainly take a look on the investigations already going on, but we also need to take our own uh, uh, conclusions. So we dig into all the different uh, situations and allegations. Uh, we will um, hopefully, uh, well, we will need four months uh, to, to do this research. So we hope to finish the report before summer. And uh, we have planned a lot of meetings in order to uh, hear a lot of actors involved uh, we would like to go also to Warsaw to, if, if, if the COVID-19 measures allow for that, to really uh, look, at, uh, talk with different actors within Frontex, and we will need to, to, to dig into a lot of documents uh, that are available. Um, and the, I hope in the end we will look at not only the facts, 
and, and take conclusions about that, but also the factors that have played a role in that, looking at the different structures within uh, the uh, agency, but also the culture within the agency. Is this really human rights sensitive? And then come up with recommendations, uh, which of course I hope they will be followed up. Uh, because I think we need we need a strong Frontex, but with a strong Frontex, I also mean as a fundamental rights sensitive Frontex, which can be the right example to member states and also make sure that member states are on the right track if it comes to compliance with fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tineke. You already uh, touched upon so many different um, aspects and questions. Um, I'm glad we have a bit time to, to dig into some of the questions. Um, Matthias Oehl, I would very li much like you to, to shed a light on the Commission's role now that we heard from Tineke Strick um, about the Parliament's um, investigations. Um, I mean, we have some very serious allegations here. What do you see um, as the Commission's role to ensure, um, well, as uh, Tini Kastrick rightly pointed out, um, transparency, um, but also an end to impunity to pushbacks when it comes to member states as well? Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Uh, let me just inform you that for me it's a bit like a radio broadcasting because when the when the um, um, event started uh, my screen became black but if you hear me and if you see me everything is is fine um, let me start uh, with a few words about the, the legal framework we are talking about um, when we are discussing the commission's role in securing the compliance of member states and frontex with their obligation to respect fundamental rights resulting from international and eu law um, as far as border surveillance is concerned, the Schengen Borders Code applies and the Schengen Borders Code foresees that member states which are responsible for the management of the EU's external borders shall act in full compliance with relevant law. And this includes the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, as well as the Geneva Convention, and in particular it includes the non-refoulement prin principle and fundamental rights. And the same applies to all the activities of the European Border and Coast Guard, uh, which consists of Frontex and the member states' competent authorities. And not last, thanks to the European Parliament, uh, which is the co-legislator, the respect of fundamental rights is now even stronger embedded in the new European Border and Coast Guard regulation. And it's important to note that uh, the European Border and Coast Guard regulation only ended into force in December 2019. Um, it has significantly reinforced safeguards to ensure that human rights are respected in the governments and operational activities um, of Frontex. Um, what does this include? It includes a fundamental rights strategy, which was recently adopted by the Frontex Management Board. It includes a mechanism to monitor the compliance of fundamental rights in all Frontex activities. And it includes a reinforced role of the independent fundamental rights officer who is monitoring the compliance of Frontex activities. And, and that was mentioned already, uh, the ABCG regulation foresees that um, she is accompanied by 40 fundamental rights monitor, which, process, which Frontex is in the process of recruiting right now. And it is important to note, coming back to the entering into force of the regulation in December 2019, that this list of measures is currently being implemented. The agency's fundamental rights officer, I call that it's, uh, in, in, from now on FRO, plays a key role in the already existing independent complaint mechanism, which anybody can use to claim that his or her fundamental rights have been breached. The 40 fundamental right monitors will act as the FRO's eyes and ears on the ground. They shall provide advice and assistance on fundamental rights in all phases of the operational activities of the agency. And this not only for operations taking place in EU member states, but also in operations taking place in third countries under a status agreement, provided the third countries agree. The monitors will be selected and appointed by the fundamental rights officer at interim 
um, who and they act exclusively, exclusively under her hierarchical supervision, and they report only to her. Last but not least, a consultative forum, which is composed of the Fundamental Rights Agency, UNHCR, and other international organizations like the Council of Europe and NGOs, assists the Frontex Executive Director and the Frontex Management Board with independent advice in fundamental rights matters. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, each cone has two sides, and this also applies to the mission of Frontex. On the one side, the implementation of a European integrated border management is a shared responsibility of Frontex and of the border card authorities of member states. The proper functioning of the Schengen area requires the enforcement of the underlying union law provisions set out notably in the Schengen Borders Code. And this includes the rules that external borders should be crossed at border crossing points only and that all third country nationals who want to cross the external borders should undergo thorough checks. However, and this is the other side of the coin, any measures taken should be proportionate to the objective pursued and, and this is what we are discussing about, they should fully respect the fundamental rights and dignity of the people affected by those measures. And it is against this background that the Commission is very concerned about the allegations that have been raised repeatedly since last autumn and that entail a high reputational risk for Frontex and, as Tineke Strick has said, for the EU as a whole. And it is against this background that the Commission took immediately the initiative to ask for extraordinary management board meetings to discuss these issues and allegations. At the first of these meetings in November 2020, the management board established a working group on fundamental rights, legal and operational aspects of operations in the follow-up. Dineke Strick has mentioned that as well. The Commission is participating in this working group and the inquiry should leave no room for ambiguity that the agency lives up to its legal obligations. And let me inform you that the working group will present its final report on this matter to the management board um, this Friday, uh, because there we have the next extraordinary meeting. I expect that the conclusions drawn by the management board on Friday will be duly followed up by the agency and by the member states in view of ensuring full compliance of Frontex operational activities wherever the agency is operating. The revision of the agency's incident reporting system, as well as the full rollout of the new and reinforced fundamental rights framework, should also contribute to increasing transparency and accountability of these operations. Also a point Tineke Strick just mentioned. Now, what is the role of the Commission in this whole debate? Firstly, Frontex is not a body which is subordinated to the Commission. It is a self-regulated agency governed by a management board consisting of member states, Schengen associated countries and the Commission. We are sitting with two members on this board. And as a member of that board, it is inter alia called upon to advise the executive director on any manner relate, matter related to the operational management um, of the external borders. And this is what we have been doing when calling for the establishment and supporting the work of the board's working group on fundamental rights. Secondly, as guardian of the EU treaties, the Commission is required to ensure that the treaties themselves and any decisions taken to implement them, meaning in particular secondary legislation, are properly enforced. In case of border control activities, the enforcement of EU law is primarily the responsibility of member states. The Commission may open infringement proceedings against member states and bring them ultimately to the EU Court of Justice. In this context, it is important that the policy of the Commission is to open such infringements in case of persistent and structural violation of EU law, including union fundamental rights protection. Finally, coming to the topic of our debate, are human rights at the EU borders out of sight, out of mind? From my perspective, clearly not. As set out, we are currently implementing a new legal framework, 
which gives fundamental rights based on existing international law a key place in our border management. However, all allegations against the agency need to be thoroughly examined, resulting recommendations thoroughly implemented, and this as a matter of urgency. And in the interest of respect of fundamental rights, but also in the interest of a strong and respected European border and coast guard, and I fully agree with Tina Kastrick that we need to have a strong and fully respected European border and coast guard. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Oehl. Um, I would like to, since you already um, raised some, some legal frameworks, um, highly important within this discussion, I would like to um, hand over to Professor Markert. Um, I was just thinking, actually, um, the way Mr. Oehl um, presented the legal framework, they seem to be very clear. However, um, in an interview with a German newspaper, a Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, a Frontex director, Fabrice Legerie, explicitly declared the pushbacks in the Aegean waters to be a way of legally acting against criminal smugglers. So sometimes, um, I, well, or let me ask you um, this way. From your perspective as an expert on legal grounds, what is um, an, a way to um, gain control and security at EU external borders, which is really in line with the EU law and um, international law. Um, Mr. Uwe mentioned the Geneva Convention. And um, is there anything such as a legal pushback? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, no, the short answer is no, there is not. And um, I was really quite surprised to read this interview uh, in the uh, FATS um, recently. He's also given an interview to La Stampa, which contains uh, similar uh, positions. Um, what he's referring to is um, Article 7 of the um, External Sea Borders Regulation, which provides that um, in case of um, suggestions of smuggling, um, Frontex uh, operations may um, urge a ship to alter course or conduct it to a third country. Now that is something that the, that the external sea borders regulation says, but that does not uh, mean that international law provisions are suspended in these operations. And in fact, the external sea border regulation says so ex explicitly. So any Frontex operation, of course, has to be uh, in full compliance with international legal standards that are relevant to the situation, as well as uh, in full compliance with EU fundamental rights as contained in the EU Charter. Um, and that means um, international law, there is a, a protocol to the International Convention on Transnational Organized Crime on uh, international human smuggling, um, which provides, yes, that the states should uh, tackle um, international uh, crime um, relating, uh, organized crime relating to human smuggling, but not at the expense of the rights of migrants involved in the smuggling operation. They should not be criminal, and so on and so forth. And also their rights to free movement should not necessarily be impaired by action activities directed at the smugglers. Um, the second is um, that the Refugee Convention, the Geneva Convention on the Status of Refugees, provides that if um, a person enters a country irregularly as a refugee, they should not be criminally pros prosecuted for entering irregular in an irregular manner. So here too, we see, you know, yes, irregularity of entry is a typical problem for refugees because they cannot uh, access uh, safe and legal ways um, of migration in order to seek protection. And this is something that already in 1951, um, the states foresaw. And then finally, I think this is the most important point. Um, Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Article 4 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights still stand, and they grant protection against refoulement. And in the case of the Charter, there's also a provision against uh, collective expulsion, um, which 
for the European Convention on Human Rights. Greece hasn't actually ratified, but um, this doesn't really matter because now we're talking about an EU operation and the EU Charter definitely provides for this. And that means um, that anyone on board of those, uh, of those dinghies who are intercepted, um, who can be taken to risk um, persecution or any severe human rights threats in the country of destination, or chain refoulement to another country where they will then face such risks must be given access to a procedure where these claims can be examined. Um, and the provision, uh, the prohibition of collective expulsion means you cannot, if you encounter a group of migrants at the border, for example, um, you cannot simply send them back without examining their individual cases. So this prohibition really secures access to um, the prohibition of uh, refoulement. The European Court of Human Rights has made it very clear that this prohibition also applies at the high seas. Uh, at the external sea borders, of course, it also applies. So in these cases, um, we must assume that this constitutes collective expulsion because there's really no difference to the, um, to the situation that the European Court of Human Rights examined in 2012 in the Hirsi Jama versus Italy judgment. Um, so such um, blanket returns are not in compliance with um, fundamental rights and international human rights. That much is clear even if um, the external sea borders regulation might provide for such situations, then fundamental rights and international human rights would prohibit um, this type of operation. Um, in the case that those boats are in distress, of course, there are additional obligations under the law of the sea, for example, um, to provide rescue and to uh, bring persons to a place of safety. <clears throat> um, in fact, what we see is that the Greek border guards are rendering any vessels that are still functioning dysfunctional, thereby placing those people in distress and pushing them back out to sea. So this is in, there is no way in which this is compli compliant with international law standards. Um, you may also argue that there is a violation of the duty to protect human lives um, under your jurisdiction if there are member state forces involved or um, Frontex forces involved. And in fact, this too is something that the Frontex regulation already provides for. In the same um, regulation that I already mentioned in Article 4 of the European, um, uh, sorry, the External Seaborders Regulation, um, it is explicitly stated that there must be, even for boats intercepted, an individual assessment of the situation of the people on board. They have to be identified and so on. No blanket pushbacks. So this is a clear violation both of EU secondary law, of EU fundamental rights, and of international human rights. Um, I, did, I was somewhat surprised, um, however, to find in the uh, preliminary uh, working group report, which has been uh, leaked, to find a reference to a more recent uh, decision by the European Court of Human Rights in the matter of ND and NT versus Spain. Um, now that was a case that concerned the land border between the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta Melilla and uh, the third country of Morocco. In that case, the court affirmed that um, pushing migrants back through the fences between Ceuta and, or Melilla, I think it was, and uh, Morocco constitutes an expulsion, which is also collective, but it invented a new exception to this uh, prohibition saying, but oh, if they had effective access to uh, legal ways of crossing into the country and they didn't use them and there's really no excuse for that and they're also using force and and there's many of them, then this is not a violation. Nobody really knows where this exception comes from. It certainly does not come from prior jurisprudence of the court, even though the court uh, sort of creates the impression that it does. Um, and the report seems to suggest that this can be transposed to the C uh, situation. Now, ND and NT is a grand chamber's decision, but so is Hirsi Jamar and others versus Italy. And in ND and NT in February 2020, the court affirmed several times that the jurisprudence in the Hirsi case stands. The Hirsi case was one on collective expulsion. These migrants were intercepted by Italian boats, Italian coast guards, they were brought back to Libya. This constituted a collective expulsion. 
So there is no reason to assume that the court will uh, overturn um, this grand chamber decision in a new case. But even if it does, and I think this is important to note, the obligation to respect the prohibition of non refoulement continues to apply. This is a decision that only concerns collective expulsion, but the prohibition of refoulement stands no matter how people arrive in a country. There is no exception. This is an absolute guarantee, which has certain procedural implications, such as access to an individual uh, review of any um, risks that the person uh, may advance um, to say that they cannot be sent back to a country. Thank you very much, Professor Markhardt, for this um, very enlightening um, introduction to the legal uh, sphere, so to say. Um, that's very interesting indeed. Um, I would like to, you already mentioned uh, the, the concrete situation um, at the Greek-Turkish um, Greek maritime border and um, the well, allegations or what 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 we have seen throughout the last year, especially um, I mean, we see, we've seen video footage and and uh, very specific uh, documentation of, as you rightly said, um, Greek officials um, destroying um, those thingies, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I would like to ask um, the Greek ombudsman, Mr. Potakis, to um, well give give us. Um, your perspective on the current situation. Um, and I mean, we know that the Greek civil society is very outspoken. We had recently um, human rights organizations um, being very, uh, publishing a report um, and being critical uh, towards Greek authorities and EU authorities as well um, because of the growing use of pushbacks. Um, we even have the legal center uh, or Lesbos who um, accuses the Greek state of committing crimes against humanity um, at its borders. Um, at the same time, we um, have a Greek government that is continues to, to dismiss um, allegations um, as fake news. So um, we were, we are very curious to hear from you, Mr. Potakis. Thank you very much. And um, I'm grateful for the invite. It's actually, I think, the first time that I am invited in a sort of an international panel to discuss about this uh, uh, quite provocative uh, issue. Uh, I hope I will be given more chances to state our position uh, in the near future. I will explain why. I think I will give, in any case, the incentive for such invites. Um, I will be very brief. Clearly, I have heard a lot of things already uh, I would have liked to comment upon. Um, and as you know, most of the times, uh, ombudsmen are uh, quite critical. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that I will not make the difference. Um, but um, before perhaps uh, uh, commenting on what I have uh, heard uh, by the previous uh, excellent interlocutors, I would like to, to highlight uh, three points, if I may, uh, and then move on, on from there. First of all, um, in uh, perhaps in a form of a disclaimer, or a couple of disclaimers, if I may, just to explain what the Greek Ombudsman is um, uh, doing and uh, what the Greek Ombudsman's mandates are. Um, because not all ombudsmen have the same mandates, and so I have to clarify a bit exactly what our scope of competences are, let's say. Um, the ombudsman in Greece is uh, also the so-called NPM, the preventive mechanism under the OPCAT uh, uh, of the United Nations. Uh, we are also the equality body, and we also have, apart from the traditional standard, let's say, competences of uh, complaint handling as ombudsman, we also have a special mandate uh, participating in the disciplinary proceedings against uh, enforcement agencies, Greek enforcement agencies, that includes both uh, the police and the Coast Guard. Uh, we are not substituting the internal bodies of either uh, agency when it comes to disciplining their officers, but we are uh, participating in the proceeding uh, separately, and we are exercising uh, oversight uh, on uh, the proceedings and the conduct of disciplinary proceedings. 
Uh, having said that, I, I mention all this because I want to, to emphasize and perhaps highlight that uh, we have different mandates uh, and depending on the different, let's say, role that we assume on the specific cases, we have different instruments, a different toolkit, if I may put it this way, that we can use, make use of in order to conduct our investigations. But uh, we also have limitations. Uh, and I, I just wanted to make it clear that uh, every ombudsman has limitations in either the scope of competences or the instruments available in order to conduct a thorough investigation, especially when public authorities, state authorities in whatever state uh, are not um, uh, fully cooperative, cooperating. Now, um, two, two pieces of news, if I may, two bits of news, if I may. First, uh, I have heard that it has, it has been uh, mentioned repeatedly by my, uh, my colleagues, my interlocutors, that um, there is a growing uh, sort of uh, uh, number of cases or of incidents reported in the last, couple, in the last year of alleged pushbacks um, in the uh, southeastern part of uh, the European Union in Greece, the borders of Greece and Turkey. I would like to make a correction. We have had allegations of pushbacks for many, many years. Uh, and I would like to remind everyone who is uh, following this discussion that um, uh, uh, my office, I was, um, uh, uh, I had decided the, uh, as early as in 2017, so it, it has been three and a half years now, to open up an own investigation uh, an own initiative investigation on alleged pushbacks um, uh, in the land borders of Greece with Turkey, that is the Evros area, for those who are perhaps more familiar with the geography of the place. Um, after specific uh, complaints of pushbacks relating to uh, uh, groups of individuals that um, were alleged to have been uh, returned back uh, illegally, to have been returned and forcibly uh, returned back to, to, to Turkey via the river of Evros. And the intervention of both the then Commissioner of Human Rights of the Council of Europe uh, and a number of other uh, uh, institutions and key actors, including also political parties represented in the Greek Parliament. So I had opened up this own initiative investigation and I would like to share with you that in the next perhaps week or a couple of weeks, I will be in the position uh, to present an interim uh, report. Uh, I emphasize interim. Uh, it's not, we are not, we haven't concluded our investigation even though three and a half years have passed because we have expanded and extended our investigation in order to include several other complaints that we, that have been filed to our office uh, since 2017. Uh, these incidents that uh, are numbered in the tens of cases already uh, involve only incidents, at least this is the, the, the scope of our own in initiative investigation, incidents of alleged pushbacks in the land border of Greece and Turkey. Uh, clearly, we have also received a number of complaints, a number of uh, allegations for uh, pushbacks that have taken place, that are assumed, alleged to, that, to have taken place in the uh, Aegean, in the sea borders between Greece and Turkey again, and we are also uh, following suit these uh, allegations and uh, investigating them to the extent possible under our present, um, uh, as I mentioned, scope of competence and uh, uh, sort of richness of instruments available. This is the first piece of news, so perhaps in a couple of weeks or so, I will be at more liberty to discuss some of the, um, perhaps if not findings, but some of the patterns that seem to uh, emerge from the, uh, uh, the analysis that we have conducted so far on the tens, I repeat, tens of incidents that we have investigated uh, of uh, alleged pushbacks in the land border between Greece and Turkey. Uh, I will be at more liberty because I will have been able to share the report, the interim report, of course, with the Greek authorities, as I have to uh, first, and perhaps also afterwards uh, publish it, uh, as we normally, uh, as ombudsmen do. 
uh, so make it publicly available to everyone so we can discuss it and perhaps I can give more information or more details on what exactly uh, we have found so far. Suffice to say, if I may, at this point, that it will be interesting not just for the Greek authorities, but also for the subject matter that is being discussed today. Uh, now, I would like to turn to the point of uh, <coughs> uh, what to do, because um, uh, our role, as I mentioned, we have different, different roles and different sort of uh, uh, mandates upon which we, we conduct our investigations when it comes to uh, the performance, let's say, of uh, enforcement agencies. Um, uh, I think what, um, what the, the most interesting part, perhaps, of such a discussion um, uh, normally is what do we need to do in order to improve uh, the um, level of response, the quality of response on the part of those who are supposed, who have undertaken the responsibility of ensuring that agencies such as Frontex or national enforcement agencies are uh, complying with uh, both human rights, international human rights law, but also domestic uh, national legislation and EU law, of course, as well. Um, I would like to, to make two points here on the Euro, at the European level, uh, because at the national level, I could perhaps share with you some of the uh, proposals that we, we have discussed with the Greek authorities, with the Greek government, uh, on, on ways perhaps to improve our, our own uh, efficiency as ombudsman, uh, as the authority that is charged, that is tasked with uh, perhaps monitoring uh, enforcement agencies. Um, but I would like to focus on the European level of the discussion. First, um, I am very much looking forward to see how the discussion on the uh, border control monitoring mechanism will evolve. The discussion that uh, has opened up, if I may put it this way, perhaps officially opened up after the publication of the Commission Pact uh, earlier, uh, well, in the, in, in the early autumn of 2020. So I'm very much looking forward to see how this discussion will develop. Uh, I have to say that um, although both myself uh, as a Greek Ombudsman and I know a, a number of other colleagues uh, across Europe and uh, in other EU member states, national Ombudsmen, have expressed reservations uh, and perhaps even have been critical on a number of uh, provisions entailed in both the 2016 as well as the 2019 regulation of Frontex, uh, we were never invited to submit our, uh, uh, com our concerns, even though, even though we do form part of the so-called complaint mechanism that was established in 2016 uh, we, uh, in the frame of the, the Frontex regulation, the European uh, Border and Coast Guard regulation, uh, as uh, closely cooperating with uh, the fundamental rights officer of uh, uh, Frontex in conducting her own investigations. Um, I have heard Mr. Earl mentioning that the fundamental rights officer uh, of Frontex is independent and that the complaint mechanism is independent. Uh, we can discuss it later, perhaps. I do have a different view on that. Uh, and the point that I'm trying to make is that um, although I highly appreciate and I highly value every internal mechanism and every internal body, uh, charged with uh, monitoring and exercising oversight on the performance of uh, any public authority, any public service, and perhaps even more so uh, oversight on the performance of enforcement agencies, of security agencies. I would like to share with you the opinion that uh, I believe that it is of uh, vital importance to have also a, a so-called external mechanism so that is a, a body that is truly independent, that it is outside the administrative parameters of the service that is under investigation. This is what we are doing in Greece as ombudsmen for the police uh, and the Coast Guard. So the Greek authorities, the Greek uh, 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 enforcement agencies, that is both the police and the Coast Guard, they do have internal bodies who have, who perhaps enjoy some form of uh, functional independence uh, when they conduct their uh, disciplinary or otherwise investigations, yet they remain internal. Uh, 
And this is a, one of the reasons that uh, the court of Strasbourg, the Council of Europe, uh, and eventually the Greek government uh, uh, decided to award us this special mandate to conduct parallel disciplinary investigations as external independent authority outside the administrative structure, the organigram, okay, the, 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 the form the, the, of, of uh, any of the enforcement agencies. I put it to you that I, I consider this to be of uh, immense importance uh, and I would like very much to see uh, in the discussions that will, I hope, uh, uh, follow in the next uh, in the next period, uh, I would like to see this point uh, raised as highly and as as vocally as possible, uh, uh, in order to truly uh, come about uh, to create a, a proper uh, mechanism uh, that will be truly independent and that will be truly uh, assisting in uh, fact finding and in uh, increasing the transparency of the procedures within such institutions, within, within such uh, public services. I would like to, to inform you, for instance, that we have, I have had the opportunity of discussing these matters with a number of uh, European um, uh, authorities, a number of European actors and agents, but also the European press, and uh, uh, so far I, I have to say that I haven't really seen a lot of reaction to that, I haven't seen a lot of progress made towards this direction. Uh, I repeat, I consider it vital to, for every public authority, and even more so for an authority that is exercising uh, public power as an enforcement agency, to have both a very properly functioning internal mechanism uh, for investigating wrongdoings and an external mechanism as well. Uh, they should both work together. Um, Perhaps I should leave it at this point, and uh, the discussion uh, during the discussion we can uh, elaborate further. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Potakis. Um, I don't know. Maybe uh, Mr. Öl wants to uh, respond um, for the commission, as you like. Yes. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for for giving me um, the floor. Um, I also took uh, one or two questions from the from the chat, which I which I saw. Um, first, you know, let me, and I, I listened very carefully to, to Mrs. Marquardt, um, who has uh, very well explained the legal framework under um, the Regulation 656 out of, out of 2014. Um, I think what is, what is important is um, Frontex being on mission on the sea, each border guard, or the European Border and Coast Guard being, being on the sea, has to decide within seconds, is it an illegal entry? Or is it a humanitarian situation where people are asking for asylum, uh, where uh, it is a boat in distress, etc.? Taking these decisions, mistakes can, of course, happen. That is absolutely clear. And then we need, and that is, I think, what the discussion is currently about, then we need the right transparent and accountable mechanisms in order to take immediate measures if mistakes happen. Um, so, um, we have the legal, and I, I explained that the legal fundamental rights framework in place, it now needs to be rolled out um, in full transparency and accountability. And that's where we are currently. And uh, the working group of the, the subgroup of the management board is in particular looking um, into the reporting system of the agency and in how far this will need uh, to be um, um, reformed. Second point, um, which was mentioned in the in the questions and answers, um, the screening proposal. Um, the screening proposal explicitly foresees, which is uh, within the pact, it explicitly foresees that um, member states need to um, build up a national fundamental rights mechanism. And this with the guidance and in close cooperation with the fundamental rights agency. So this commission proposal would then also um, build up, you know, we talked about the Frontex mechanism, but it would also build up with regard to the screening fundamental rights mechanisms, independent fundamental rights mechanisms on the national level. And by the way, the commission is currently um, in very close contact with the Croatian authorities that such a mechanism is being built up there as well. Um, and finally, Mr. Potakis uh, 
said, you know, that um, from his perspective, the fundamental rights officer of Frontex is not independent. Um, I would say, you know, we are currently um, in the process of recruiting the first formal fundamental rights officer under the new regulation. Currently, we have an, a fundamental rights officer at, at interim due to the illness um, of the, the sincere illness of the former one. Um, under the new regulation, the FRO has his or her own budget. The FRO is independent to recruit the staff which is working there. The FRO is the appointing authority for the, fundament, for the fundamental rights monitors. Um, and the FRO has always the right to immediately report to the management board in case of problems. So that's why I would say that uh, the legal framework is there to guarantee the independence of the fundamental rights officer. And I forgot the consultative forum to which the FRO can always address um, any problems or complaints he or she might have. I leave it there not to, to become too long. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Oehl. Um, with a look at the clock, it's already five past four and we want to bring in our participants. Um, Matthias Oehl already started um, looking into the uh, questions in the Q&A, so I will continue doing that. Um, so we have one question. We already, Mr. Potakis mentioned the new pact. Um, maybe I'll start with this one. How can violations of fundamental rights pre be prevented under the, the new pact on migration and asylum, in particular to the proposal for a screening regulation? You answered that. When Frontex role is not clearly defined, nor is the monitoring of their involvement. I still want to... Um, ask someone else, maybe Tineke Strick, to uh, shed a light on this question. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And <clears throat> if I may uh, react quickly on, on the contributions of others, I, I would really concur with uh, what Nora Market just said, that uh, I also uh, happen to have a look in the, in the interim report, so we have to see how the final report looks like. But there, indeed, I was a bit shocked by the kind of selective uh, uh, way that case law has been referred to. And I completely agree that, uh, you know, it, it seems to be that ND and NT is, is, is often referred to and used in order to, to say that, look, the criteria have changed, the legal framework has changed. And, and I think it's very clear that this is not the case. I mean, the most important criterion that has never changed is that there should be an individual examination uh, in order to make sure that there's no refoulement uh, undertaken by, by the authorities. And this is what is at stake here. And I think the more we uh, start to create a kind of fuss around the criteria, the more it distracts from the problems that we have right now in enforcement of the current are key. And I think we should be aware of, of that. Um, and then about this monitor mechanism, uh, uh, thanks also a lot to Andreas, Mr. Potakis, for your contribution. And I will, I will make sure that, that the uh, position and the views of the National Ombudsman are taken into account in our inquiry, because I really think that, that you are key also in, uh, in, in doing those monitor exercises. And I also agree with you that Although I'm happy that there is a critical assessment right now of the internal mechanism, I really look forward to the conclusions of the EU Ombudsman, to what extent the current complaint mechanism is independent and effective and what needs to be changed, that an external mechanism would really be an important uh, addition to that. It's, 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 it has a different function. And uh, although I think we can improve, you know, the guarantees of, of making the flow and the complaint mechanism more independent, um, with um, having also a role for national monitoring bodies in a pool together with the Council of Europe, we can have more guarantees of transparency and, uh, and have an, 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 a swift and effective uh, way of, of responding to signals uh, that can come along with that. Uh, and I think it's also important if you include national monitoring bodies, you also have the expertise and the knowledge of the local situation. And I think this is also uh, uh, an essential element. Um, regarding yeah, the new proposals, um, 
I think, of course, what, what the commissioner always says, Johansson, is with this proposal, we can prevent and combat pushback practices. Uh, I'm a bit more skeptical about that, because if you look at the proposal, it it's, uh, obliges member states to have an independent national monitor mechanism, a body being uh, monitoring the, uh, uh, the formal screening procedure. This is taking place in a formal border crossing point or a center or whatever. Uh, but it does not ensure at all that we have a proper monitoring mechanism at all parts of the borders that we have. So the green areas, the green zones, the blue zones, those places where uh, the pushbacks take place normally. They do not take place from a formal uh, office. So uh, I think in that sense, it, it, did, it, it will not solve it. Uh, furthermore, although it can be an improvement, right? I, I do not say that it's it, it's a bad proposal, but it's simply not sufficient to uh, uh, to make sure that pushbacks don't take place. For the screening regulation, I would say we also need criteria for resources, the mandate, and independence, because not in all member states those uh, border uh, those monitor mechanisms have the right mandate to 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 do this job so that should be ensured um and then again we need to make sure that the commission is going to supervise it and to also take action if uh, those monitoring comes up with signals that things are wrong because monitoring is one thing but we need also a response to signals uh, about violations. I think this is very important. And also monitor mechanism cannot replace individual access to justice. Uh, and I think this is very important if you look at the current screening regulation, uh, there are no effective remedies. Uh, there are really uh, you know, grounds for, for, for serious concerns that people cannot uh, uh, you know, hold authorities accountable or have a possibility to complain or appeal to a decision. So these two always have to be in place uh, independent from uh, each other. Yeah, I think I leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tineke Strick. We have plenty of questions um, and I'm looking through them, um, but maybe before we um, before we continue, I'm sorry. Um, well, we have one uh, participant rem reminding us of the situation um, in the central Mediterranean, asking us to not forget the ongoing and horrible situation with respect to Libya. Um, e the EU continues to invest in the Coast Guard, irrespective uh, also of the growing number of legal cases or injunctions on this, including before the International Criminal Court of Justice. This is rather a comment. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to say anything to this. Um, then I have a maybe specifically legal question that I would like to, um, to uh, present to Nora Markert. Um, Thomas Molnar is asking, what do you think about the chances of the recently initiated action for failure to act under Article 265 Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union against Frontex? Yes, great question. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I think you know a little bit more than me there. I try to look up uh, who initiated this action indeed, but uh, I do think uh, that it's an interesting um, approach to use the complaints uh, mechanisms within the uh, uh, treaty. Um, the, this is a complaint that can be brought by any EU organ or, um, or also a member state um, against, uh, for example, EU institutions for failure to act. And in this case, we could, for example, say uh, Frontex should have intervened in certain situations or uh, should withdraw uh, under Article 40, 46 of the Frontex regulation. Um, so there are different avenues in which you can argue um, that there have been uh, has been a failure to act um, in within Frontex. So I think that's an interesting mechanism. Um, there's also the action for damages, which my uh, colleague Melanie Fink has looked into in a recent article in the German Law Journal, um, which is really you know designed for other things, but can also address uh, certain wrongdoings by. Um, EU agents uh, in the exercise of their offices. So I think there are a few, <clears throat> a few things that, that can be done. 
uh, even if the commission uh, seems to be more focused on processes rather than prosecution here. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here for Mr. Oehl as well um, from Franziska Filmer. Um, so does the EU Commission deny the existence of pushbacks at the mentioned borders? And if not, would the Commission be willing to officially and publicly condemn them? If this would be a problem for the EU Commission now, don't you believe that the suggested monitoring mechanism in the screening regulation will just stay a fig leaf instead of a robust mechanism? So again, a question regarding the new migration pact and um, the new proposals on the table. Mr. Oehl, if you could answer that. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. The, the answer is very simple. Um, the Commission um, condemns pushbacks nearly on a, on, a, on a daily basis. I mean, it's absolutely clear that pushbacks are against fundamental rights and they, um, they, they, they need to be um, uh, fightened. Um, however, allegations on single cases have to be investigated and have to be examined. And that is sometimes uh, the problem, and this is also some, something which the working group uh, uh, um, of the Frontex Management Board is doing currently, that they go through all the, the um, um, allegations and see, you know, in how far uh, they, they are reasoned, um, in how far there was a wrongdoing, um, etc. But it goes without saying that the Commission is um, absolutely against um, pushbacks and regards them as being absolutely um, illegal. Um, let me use the opportunity to, to make uh, two, three remarks on what, uh, what uh, colleagues on, on the panel said. Um, first, Mrs. Marquardt said that the Commission is not focused on, on investigations. Yes, because the Commission is not an investigator. The Commission is also not a public prosecutor. Um, we are reliable and that's why the national mechanisms and the work of the national ombudsman are so important. We are relying on this information. And that's why we also have proposed this, uh, these national um, 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 mechanisms. Um, and then if there is a systematic breach of the law, the Commission uh, acts with, re with infringements, etc. But the Commission cannot be in a role to investigate single cases. This is for the national authorities and not for the European level. Um, and the final point, just on the screening proposal, once again, um, Mrs. Strick will, will certainly um, agree that the screening proposal and the fundamental rights mechanism um, foreseen within this proposal applies to all migrants which are um, taken up um, outside border crossing points. And I think that is a very important point that for these um, scope of application of the screening procedure, the national fundamental rights mechanisms would apply. Thank you. Okay, I see Tanika Strick wants to uh, reply. Maybe I can uh, incorporate another question and then we have a, a broader um, um, answer or with a view to time management. Maybe I just read uh, two, three questions and you choose who, who wants to pick which ones because we have a couple of questions left. Um, there's one, thank you very much, Mr. Uhl. There's one for you specifically um, asking, I understand from your brief reply on regulation 656 that it's an all depends situation that the commission has not been able to give clear guidance to Frontex on what constitutes a legal interception as opposed to a pushback. Is it right? And does the commission accept any responsibility for possible errors at the borders due to delays in providing Frontex the clear legal advice it requires? Um, and then I have, or no, I see the questions are all, um, I, I have two more questions that are open for whoever feels to answer them. Um, from Clara Cotre Cotroneo, do standing corps receive appropriate training? By appropriate, I mean including on traf trafficking, smuggling, which both the Commission and Frontex still confuse with one another, and asylum. Um, and who does the fundamental rights officer answer to? Um, 
she he answers to the management board this means that if the management board has a certain position the fundamental right officer will not be able to go against it um i don't know exactly if this is a question or rather a comment um so whoever feels like answering i think we'll start with tinica yeah tinica please Okay, yes, uh, thanks, because then I can immediately uh, uh, respond also to what Matthias Hill said. Um, yes, well, of course, the, the guardian of the treaty, the commission uh, ha has a more easy job if it comes to if national legislation is not uh, properly uh, in line with EU law. That's, that's very clear. But it's, it's very clear that also practices that are not in compliance with EU law have to be, um, um, well, that, that this has to be enforced, that there has to be uh, the possibility of enforcing with EU law. Now, of course, this needs to be, uh, have the systematic character. That's, that's completely true. But what we see, what we know from all the reports and so many member states at the moment, uh, that we see a systematic character of those uh, violations. It's not that there are only individual cases uh, mentioned and that you can doubt about, well, is this an incident or not? It's also, for instance, the Croatian Ombudsman clearly says this is not about incidents. Uh, so I wonder, I can imagine, for instance, with Croatia, that the Croatian Ombudsman will be that monitoring body that you mentioned uh, that you have foreseen in the screening regulation. If the Ombudsman then comes with those reports about consistent systematic practices, and even if the government then denies that this has taken place or that they declare all complaints inadmissible, what will the Commission do then? Will it, will it really rely on these monitoring reports? Because this is actually then the idea of the screening regulation, um, or will it then again say, yeah, well, it has to be investigative and this, and this is not our role. So how can we see that in practice uh, working? Um, and you say it also applies to people who have been taken somewhere else. Yes, but if they have been pushed back somewhere else, in what way can they fall under the scope of the screening regulation? As, uh, I'm just curious to know how you can see uh, that this uh, will function and also what we can do now, because the screening regulation, it may take years before we have new legislation. So, and uh, the urgency is very clear regarding the fundamental rights violations at the border. So what could we do now then in order to stop those uh, violations? I, I saw one question to me on how we can, from Peter Bendel, how we can make uh, uh, um, what we should change in order to strengthen the role of the parliament. I hope that we will manage to also come up with recommendations regarding transparency, for instance. Uh, and uh, the duty to inform the parliament, because already it says in the regulation that Frontex will inform the parliament to the extent possible. But uh, to be honest, this is very limited, uh, uh, the information that we get. It's not much more than uh, that journalists receive, actually, in the end. So uh, I think there's a lot of improvement to be made. And I really hope that the Frontex scrutiny group will also be a step into a better scrutiny and control of uh, the Frontex uh, performances in, in every aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tini Kistrick. Um, Mr. Potekis wants to um, answer to that. I also have three questions here. And if you allow me, I would read them out loud and, and you can have a mix of answers. I know this is the impossible, um, but but answers to them and maybe some some kind of like um, final remark because um, we are kind of running out of time um, and many questions are left. So allow me to briefly read out. Um, we have Petra Bennel um, as well asking, how do you assess the monitoring mechanism as suggested in the pact, particularly the fact that the member states themselves will be in charge to monitor and the fundamental rights officers only consulted, agency, sorry, only consulted, and um, 
Another question, could the consultative forum as an already existing external control institution be strengthened and how? This goes to everyone, but also to you, Mr. Potakis. Then specifically to you as well, can you talk a bit more about your role in disciplinary procedures and your experiences? Are there any ongoing procedures against free coast guards on the national level? And um, again, Mr. Potakis, what do you think Europeans should tackle, tackle um, the steadily and fast increasing migration pressure by both people more and more consisting of unaccompanied children and pregnant women? On the one hand, I think it should be how do you think we should Greece should tackle. On the one hand, we have no moral justification to refuse them. On the other hand, the pull effect might incredibly grow if we let them in. Any solutions? Mr. Potakis, I'm sorry, this is a broad uh, collection of questions, but um, we are curious to hear. I hope I, uh, you can hear me more clearly now. And uh, again, I will have to be very brief. So my answers will be in the form of bullet points clearly. Uh, of course, if we had more time, we would have uh, uh, had the opportunity to discuss them in more detail. Well, uh, to, I'll start with the final question, the last question that you mentioned. Uh, I have been uh, hearing about the pull effect for years now. Um, I, I don't think it really uh, works. I know that this is the prevailing, let's say, uh, uh, theory uh, when it comes to how to uh, construct the policy, the deterrent policy, uh, it doesn't work in practice. Uh, those who are uh, on the side, those who are in the field, realize that uh, there is no pull effect uh, actually in place and it doesn't work. There are other dynamics that uh, are more uh, active uh, and determine the flows uh, rather than uh, whether there is an effective uh, uh, deterrent sort of uh, uh, mechanism or a deterrent uh, atmosphere vis-à-vis uh, -vis the third country nationals wishing to enter the European Union. I leave it to this. We can discuss it for hours. Um, I, I would like to return to the point on the mechanism. I want to make it clear, absolutely as clear as possible uh, by drawing a parallel to what has been the case when it comes to uh, the involvement of Frontex in forced return operations of third country nationals, okay? Because this is perhaps the most, the closest uh, that uh, national uh, investig investigatory authorities like myself, like mine, uh, have been uh, working with uh, Frontex so far. Uh, when it comes to the to the, fro uh, the forced return operations and the, the involvement of Frontex in forced return operations, as has been mentioned. Uh, the 2016 regulation established a complaint uh, a mechanism um, uh, that was limited. I, I heard your, your, your introductory remarks. You are quite right. It is limited. Uh, it is not uh, all embracing. It is not covering all sorts and types of complaints that might be filed to Frontex uh, on uh, certain operations uh, conducted by Frontex or organized by Frontex or coordinated by Frontex. Um, but the, the crucial point here is that there was a complaint mechanism foreseen in 2016, in the 2016 regulation. There was no monitoring mechanism. Instead, the, the 2016 uh, regulation envisaged uh, the so-called pool of monitors, which is not a mechanism. It is far from being a mechanism. Now, the 2019 uh, regulation set up is, has, has sort of uh, provided, let's say, for the creation of an internal body consisting of the 40 experts that uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, that will be conducting monitoring for uh, on Frontex operations. But again, as I mentioned earlier, this will be an internal body. This will be people, staff, experts, no doubt, but hired by Frontex to conduct uh, monitoring of Frontex operations. What is, what is truly lacking here is the external element. Now, the, the critical, I think one of the crucial legal issues that will have to be addressed uh, if at some point the European uh, Union as a whole uh, comes to the conclusion that there has to be a mechanism involving also national uh, authorities, 
Um, I think there, is a, there are a number of critical legal issues that will have to be addressed. First of all, national authorities like the Ombudsman, like national Ombudsman, who have both uh, the experience, the expertise, the investigatory uh, capacity and operational capacity. So they do have a, a number of sort of advantages, let's say, in order to be selected, to be involved. Uh, they are national authorities and their mandate uh, is uh, uh, limited to uh, investigating national authorities. Um, again, to draw a parallel, I don't, I don't want to, to, to monopolize now the discussion, so we're already running very late, but to draw a parallel, when uh, we are investigating, for instance, the, the, the quality of interviews conducted for third country nationals entering uh, Greece, we are also making, uh, trying to also involve in our investigation the, the performance of the other staff who are employed in Greece, Notwithstanding the fact that the ASO is an EU agency, so in, in actual terms, I mean, if one wants to be very simplistic, we would not have the competence to conduct any sort of investigation vis-a-vis -vis against EASO staff because EASO falls under the remit of perhaps the European Ombudsman, the EU Ombudsman, or somebody else, but clearly not my office because I am you know, my, my, my uh, competences are limited to the point of investigating Greek authorities. Uh, having said that, we did that. We were investigating EASO because we considered, we were considering EASO to be uh, performing their services here in Greece uh, 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 as a form of secondment to the Greek administration, okay? Uh, so it is a legal construction uh, that we have come about in order to, to offer some sort of uh, oversight into their uh, role because nobody else is investigating them. This is the concern. If we do set up a, a, a mechanism that will be investigating, monitoring, exercising oversight in order to hold Frontex accountable and in order to increase transparency of procedures, uh, if that involves national authorities, we will need to have uh, not specific, not isolated national authorities, but perhaps a mechanism, a proper functioning mechanism not again a pool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Potakis. Indeed, we are running out of time. And indeed, these questions, we could, I think, all discuss them um, for hours. Um, I still, we have some questions left uh, in the Q&A, but I'm afraid we, we don't have the time to answer them. This time, I still want to leave the floor to Matthias Oehl and then Professor Marka to give final remarks um, from your perspective. Yes, uh, you uh, you mentioned the the question of uh, of uh, of uh, one of the colleagues um, on the um, advisory role of the Commission or the monitoring uh, by the Commission of Frontex. Um, maybe it's quite interesting, you know, to once again underline that these self-regulated agencies are sp special animals. So um, the um, advisory and monitoring role for Frontex is with the management board. It is not subordinated to the Commission. And the Commission, of course, plays a very active role in this in this management board. So over the last year, after the entering into force of the EBCG regulation in December 2019, we, for example, have developed in the management board the complete uh, implementation framework for the fundamental rights provisions which are foreseen in the, in the mandate. Uh, the management board recently adopted um, the fundamental rights strategy as a kind of um, last piece um, in the jigsaw, and now we have to. Uh, the agency has to has to implement uh, that. Uh, important is also that Frontex, you know, when operating when uh, operating together with member states, Frontex operates under the command of the mem of the respective member state. So it's not, you know, that uh, Frontex is has has the command in these operations. It is always um, under the um, command acting under the command of. Um, member states. Um, I think we have done a lot um, now in order to um, have a well-functioning fundamental rights framework um, by the agency. We will now wait and discuss the report of the working group of the management board. We will also wait for the um, examinations um, undertaken uh, by the European Parliament. And on that basis, we will need to reflect whether, whether further guidance, which is also one of the questions um, will be um, necessary. 
Um, I leave it here because we are really running out of time. I saw that there were three, four other questions, but I, I apologize that I can't take them. Thank you. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, Tineke has uh, made a lot of the points that I would have wanted to make, and she's made them so much better than me. So uh, let me just add one thing. Um, Matthias Uhr has, has rightly said the commission is not an investigatory uh, organ, but it is the guardian of the treaties. So if the EU is talking but not acting, that is also sending a signal, and that is highly problematic in my view. And in fact, we do have a lot of investigation already here done by investigative journalists uh, from Bellingcat, for example, from Lighthouse Reports, from Der Spiegel, from The Guardian. So all the facts are here. We know this is a structural problem. And uh, if Greece is flatly denying this, and I agree with Tineke, uh, then maybe the national authorities are really not the sources to look to for uh, an effective investigation of, of uh, what is going on at the ex external borders. And I think we really need to also draw conclusions for the screening regulation here, national monitoring mechanisms are problematic in a number of respects. Either they don't work, and even if they do work, as Andreas Potakis has said, they are very limited in their mandates. Um, so I do think that we need uh, effective remedies, not just uh, internally as the Frontex regu regulation provides for, where there is disciplinary action to be taken and so on. There also needs to be individual remedies for the person's um, who are bringing the complaints and I'm still missing that and the EU Ombudsman is not an effective mechanism in that respect certainly um, and my very last point and I'll keep it very brief um, we do need clearer secondary legislation if we expect uh, EU agencies and member states to act in compliance with fundamental rights. It's not enough to have a savings clause in there that says also everything has to be in compliance with fundamental rights and human rights um, as you said, we already have uh, that in the Frontex regulation. It doesn't work. That's what we're seeing. And uh, we need to make it very clear which processes actually have to apply at the border. Um, and we can't just hope and pray that uh, everybody will comply with the obligations that they have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora Markard. So this leaves me to uh, say, first of all, a warm thank you to, to all of our today's panelists. Um, I think, the, as I said in the beginning, the number of participants really shows that, um, well, it's not out of, uh, out of sight, out of mind, thankfully. Um, also, and I'm glad um, Professor Markhardt mentioned in the, in the end the uh, role of investigating journalists and civil society organizations um, who sometimes under severe pressure came up with um, real facts and figures actually that allows us to have these discussions as today and um, I can only say as Heinrich Böll Foundation we will definitely continue uh, the debate and um, yes I look forward to hear from you in the future thank you very much.